star. I was born Volume 2 of True Tales of a Traveller begins in late star. 1984 with the sixth tale in the series over all culture shock. This story finds the young traveller, Alex, taken from the relative orderliness of a life in London I where he'd been attempting, with mixed results, to pursue a career in travel, and throws him into the furious assault on the senses that constituted life in the Indian capital, Delhi, at that time. Three travellers, Frenchman Michel, Ozzy Richard, and myself, Alex, would soon evolve into one inseparable unit, traveling and working together on the subcontinent. Everything about the flight to Delhi was comparable with any other international flight I had taken thus far with a major airline. The only difference was the travel time. Eight and a half hours made this flight the longest I had ever taken. It was only after the plane had touched down that I began to become aware of a noticeable difference between the airport and any other international airport I had visited including Tangiers, Cairo, and even Sofia in communist Bulgaria. Most rickshaws were bicycle rickshaws, and they were my preferred means of rickshaw travel. There were still many hand-pulled rickshaws in India at that time. Taking them always threw me into a dilemma. I knew the rickshaw drivers were glad of the business, but sitting with my heavy baggage, seeing their invariably scrawny bodies working so hard to pull me through the streets, always left me with a lingering sense of guilt. There were beggars in rags to be seen everywhere. They were quick to accost foreign travellers, and they were all very persistent. Red Fort, so named for its massive enclosing walls of red sandstone, was the main residence of the emperors of the Mughal dynasty for nearly 200 years, until 1857. I visited Red Fort by myself, as I planned to visit the other major attractions of the city. An intriguing and inexplicable event had occurred at the Red Fort. Wandering around the top floor at the back of the fort, I stopped to look outside, where I could see several fakirs apparently practicing their skills. Fakirs, I had read, were holy men who had taken vows of poverty and worship, renouncing all worldly possessions, and were generally regarded as possessed of miraculous powers. Everywhere you went in Delhi, the cow was king. They could be found strolling around on any street. In those places which were deemed off-limits to cows, the police gently shooed them away. Nobody treated them like animals. Cows seemed to live better and freer lives than many people. One thing was certain. None would starve, even if people did. Eating out was cheap and convenient, as well as often being a social activity. And although there were always hygiene concerns, all in all, we spent very little time afflicted by possible food poisoning or even mild digestive problems. Being so much more economical everywhere we went in India than in Northern Europe, Eating took up a lot of our time during our travels, sometimes more time than we would have wanted it to. Finally, the three of us left Delhi at the crack of dawn. Most of our travels as a trio would be by rail. The country's rail network managed by Indian Railways was and is enormous, one of the largest in the world. The trains we took brought back memories of very early childhood, when there were still occasional steam trains operating on the line near our family home in northwest England. All of these adventures stood out from regular daily life, even a regular daily life that could hardly be called regular. But by the time of our arrival in Varanasi, travel seemed to have entered an entirely new dimension for me. Now, even regular daily life was on a par with those distinct adventures. Now I was living an adventure every day. I suppose the reason for this was that there were so many new and unexpected things to cope with. As the saying goes, there was never a dull moment. When we actually got to the riverside and had a look around, 
Richard started having second thoughts about looking for the accommodation he originally had in mind. Look, how do you two feel about staying in something like that? He asked, pointing to a couple of decrepit-looking boats by the riverside, instead of a hostel or a guest house. Looking at the boats Richard was pointing to, I had my doubts they were even habitable. Richard's idea was that we should first shop for fresh vegetables, and after cleaning the place up, he would cook a meal for the three of us on Michelle's campus stove. I wasn't convinced anything worth spending time on could come of his suggestion, or even that it was possible to cook anything worth eating on the boat. Well, you're the cook, Richard, I countered. Why don't you do that while we take a look around this river? And we can meet up again in a couple of hours, like you say. I'd like to give that thing a try, I added, pointing to a rowing boat moored alongside the houseboat. Then a remarkable thing happened. Suddenly a huge, dark fish jumped from the water and back into it, right at the side of the boat. The event was so unexpected, Michel almost lost the oars, and I almost fell out of the boat. What was that? I exclaimed as I steadied myself with both hands and cautiously tried to return to my seat. It looked like a shark. Don't worry, it's gone, whatever it was, Michel assured me as he got back to grips with the oars. But I kept a vigilant lookout for any sign of the creature's reappearance. I could see movement beneath the water a few metres away and pointed that out. I don't think it could have been a shark. The Ganji shark is supposed to be very elusive, difficult to get to see even for people looking for them. It was probably a Ganges dolphin. He turned to look again in the direction the creature had been swimming. I looked at Michel in disbelief. A what? Are you kidding me? You don't get dolphins and sharks in a river? Michel was about to tell me otherwise when he cut short with, There it is! The town of Kajuruho was much smaller, cleaner and quieter than I had expected, with a population of perhaps ten to 15,000 at the time of our visit. It wasn't until the next day that we got to look at what Kajuruho is famous for, its temples which were built between 950 and 1050. Though famous for their erotic sculptures, sexual themes cover less than 10% of the temple sculptures. Nevertheless, being so out of place in Indian society, it's only natural that the erotic sculptures would come to be what the temples were most famous for. The sculptures were inlaid on temple walls and were very raunchy indeed. Seeing them seemed almost surreal in the India of the late 20th century, which was still a very conservative society. It was very rare at that time to even see couples touching or holding hands in public. On the second day in Agra, we went to check out what is certainly one of the most famous constructions in the world, the Taj Mahal. I hoped to get a photo of the building from the front and spent a long time trying to. Neither Michel nor Richard carried a camera, and they soon lost interest in waiting around for me. I finally took one shot in frustration after a seemingly endless time looking around fruitlessly for an angle that would not include crowds of people. I had, of course, seen plenty of photos of the Taj Mahal before without a soul in sight, and I wondered how they had been taken. We had arrived fairly early in the morning and the place was already teeming with visitors. Late in the afternoon, I finally managed to take a photo with almost no people in it. Then, cameras still in hand, I wandered around to the back of the main complex in the hope of getting photos of the vulture population I had seen flying around there. In the fruitless process of waiting for any of the birds to come close enough to capture with my camera, I noticed that there was a small rowing boat on a river that passed by the temple complex. And I walked closer to it, imagining that it would make a nice composition. Even having become acclimatized to Indian hygiene, 
I was taken aback at the sight and smell of this river as I drew closer. The sewage in it was so thick that to row a little boat in it like the one I had wanted to photograph would be completely unlike rowing through water. God help anyone who would fall in, I thought. Tons of untreated sewage, industrial waste, domestic waste and dumped garbage turned the Yamuna River into one of the world's most polluted, very possibly the most polluted, even decades after our travels in India. Jaipur was and is the state capital and is often known as the Pink City, as nearly all the buildings within the walled historic centre are painted a terracotta pink colour. At the time of our visit, the city had a population of just over a million, its location in the east of Rajasthan serving as a gateway to places further west in the state, such as Jodhpur and Jaisalmer, was just beginning to drive its growth as a tourist destination. Adapting to the unique circumstances of life in any region was something that I felt was done by degrees, even for culture shock immune, seasoned travellers. And we had moved one degree towards that end just by staying in the city. Doubtless, just the act of travelling to the village where Inda Dandetha's farm was located the next day would take the three of us one degree further still in our adaptation to Rajasthani life. We didn't have to actively search for Inda Dandetha after arriving in Burunda village. We just asked around if anyone knew him, and 20 minutes later, the charismatic Inda appeared again. Most people, but certainly not all people, who came into contact with Inda for any length of time, could not help but be inspired by him. At the time I met him, I was already not a person easily won over, as my original aversion to Richard bears out. I also had my doubts about Inda Dandetha when I first met him in Delhi, but after we met for the second time, and I had more opportunities to hear his opinions on a variety of local matters, I came to the conclusion that he was not merely a very hospitable farmer who happened to be well-travelled and well-versed in the ways of the outside world, fluent in English to boot. But he was, in fact, also a man with a mission. He wanted to change the way people farmed in his hometown of Burunda, and he knew that in order to achieve such an aim, he would also have to change the way local people viewed the outside world. But then there were also those who did care a great deal, and certainly didn't look upon Inda's endeavours favourably. They saw what he was doing on his farm with his weird foreign ways, and they didn't like it. Some viewed him as little less than a traitor to his culture. His family were strict vegetarians according to Hindu vegetarian precepts, and Inda's diffident wife, we later found out, would not even allow non-vegetarian food to enter into her kitchen. On our first working day on Inda's farm, our host pointed to some farmhands working on a neighbouring farm. Their pain was so low, according to Inda, it struck me that even with food and board, earning such low wages, it would be hard for us to save anything, and whatever was saved would be wiped out quickly, just by travelling, even as shoestring travellers. Richard's logic for doing voluntary work rather than bothering to find regular paid work certainly seemed to make sense. Inder informed us that he had business in Bilara the next day and asked us if we would like to go with him. He would be busy for an hour or so, after which he could show us around the town, he told us. Naturally, we readily agreed though Inda would not reveal the exact nature of his business, which was at the courthouse. The trip to this market town turned out to be a very tense and difficult one, for several unrelated or only loosely related reasons. One day, I was left alone to work with a neighbouring farmer, who was apparently on good terms with Inda and was providing his labour for the day. Richard was laid up with dysentery, and Michel was busy elsewhere on the farm. The farmer brought his two young children with him, so as to keep an eye on them. Nothing remains in my memory of the contents of our work, but one thing about the farmer did make a deep and lasting impression. 
When we broke for lunch, I brought out the lunch box Inda's wife had prepared, and the farmer brought out his own lunch, and we sat in the shade to eat. I immediately felt a huge sense of guilt. I had at least three or four times as much food in my lunch box as he had. But at the same time, I was in a conundrum. Working on Inda's farm was hungry work indeed, and I had been thinking about lunch for at least an hour. At that time, I found vegetarian food somehow always left me feeling I had not eaten enough, and I knew I could polish off the contents of my lunchbox with no trouble at all and still want more. But looking at this farmer sitting a few feet from me, slowly savouring his meal of half a potato and a few meagre vegetables, I could not eat my own meal. After Richard's recovery and towards the end of his stay on Inda's farm, we visited Jodhpur, which lies about 90 kilometres from Burunda. The city's Meranga Fort is one of the largest forts in India. Built around 1460, the fort is situated 125 metres above the city and is enclosed by thick walls. I tried to persuade Richard that we functioned best as a team of three and reminded him there were still several other places he said he wanted to visit in Rajasthan and elsewhere, but he felt he really didn't have the time left. Had Richard stayed around another week, he would have had an opportunity to visit one of those places that had originally been on his list of must-see locations in Rajasthan, and without needing to take time off either. For reasons I can't remember, Inda had to visit Udaipur, a city located in the south of Rajasthan, near the Gujarat border. The city, known as the City of Lakes, lies on the southern slopes of the Aravali mountain range, at an elevation of around 600 metres, and is considerably more fertile than the typically semi-arid land of central Rajasthan, let alone the very arid land of the far west of the state. I wandered around the city by the lakeside alone, on foot, and approaching sunset I happened to meet an English girl travelling alone in India. A pontoon-type boat as a small quay was about to leave for a short cruise, but only had three or four passengers, and more were wanted before it set sail. The operator was trying to persuade this girl to take the cruise, and as I walked closer, also tried to interest me. Hearing the man's attempt to induce us to take the boat trip, we smiled at each other and finally both jumped onto the boat. There was one other place Michel wanted to visit in Rajasthan before leaving the state, and this is where we went immediately after leaving Inda's farm. Jaisalmer, a city that lies 575 kilometers west of Jaipur, well into the heart of the Tar Desert close to the border with Pakistan. Known as the Golden City, Jaisalmer stands on a ridge of yellowish sandstone, crowned by Jaisalmer Fort, which contains a palace and several ornate Jain temples. The hostel we stayed at had a lively common area, and we didn't have any difficulty in getting the lowdown on camel trips into the desert. In fact, that same evening we hooked up with a Kiwi couple and a Canadian girl, who also wanted to make a camel trek, and arranged a two-night trek together starting the next morning. Later, much later in 2002, I met an Australian couple in Malaysia who had taken a camel trek from Jaisalmer not long previously. From their account, these trips had become much more commercialised by then, not to mention much more comfortable. They even slept on sturdy folding beds in the desert, whereas we slept directly on the ground in our sleeping bags. All the bus trips I took on the subcontinent in 1985 would fall into the rough travel category. Some were rough in the extreme. Falling asleep, as you may on similar long bus trips elsewhere, was almost impossible, and I managed it only on the Jammu to Kashmir trip. The condition of the roads and the condition of the buses precluded that possibility most of the time. Most bus trips left me with a great sense of accomplishment by the time I arrived at my destination. 
This feeling must have been something akin to having completed an endurance test of the kind that military special forces, for example, may be required to go through. Michel had not given up on his original first choice location to visit in India, the ashram at which India's independence leader Mahatma Gandhi had once lived in Gujarat state. Although Darjeeling had slipped off my list of potential travel destinations, I too had still not given up on my plans to visit Punjab and Kashmir. But the time spent at Indus Farm had barely made a dent in my budget. I saw no reason to miss what seemed to be yet another unique opportunity. We travelled by bus and train to Gujarat, which lies to the south of Rajasthan and is yet another large state covering an area of about 196,000 square kilometers. Unlike Rajasthan, Gujarat has an extensive coastline stretching about 1,600 kilometers. Our destination was actually located in the southeast of the state, close to the border with Maharashtra state, so it took some time to get to. The ashram, at the time this book first goes to publication in 2020, is a very different place from the time of our visit. It receives about 700,000 visitors a year, and has also received many foreign dignitaries, and even heads of state, and remains open to visitors every day of the year, from 8am to 7pm. The ashram now even has its own museum, dedicated to Gandhi, at the time of our visit, there were no other foreign visitors, and accommodation for guests, such as ourselves, was very basic, as you would expect on an ashram, and as it was for all residents. Apart from a couple of exceptions, such as the fridge, yes, singular, containing medicines that had to be kept cool, there was no electricity on the ashram. Not because electricity was not available, but on principle. Lighting in most places, including our quarters, for example, was by paraffin lamp. Our accommodation was in a room no more luxurious than the one we had shared on Indus Farm. I went with two young ashram workers on a mission to persuade local residents to follow the government's official one is enough policy. For many of the families we visited, it was evidently already too late. The children of the largest family we encountered numbered 17, and families with more than 12 children were quite common. On our first day off from joining the two dedicated young ashram workers, the four of us took a bus and then a hike to some rocky outcroppings not very far away, where Arky had noticed some eagles. He was a keen photographer, and his idea was to get some shots. I took my camera along too. The eagles probably saw us coming a long way off and were nowhere to be seen by the time we reached the place they nested. Which was just as well, as I certainly didn't fancy making the final climb up the nearly sheer rock to the summit. We got back to Delhi several days later, taking out dorm beds at the same hostel we had stayed when we first arrived in the country. Michel flew to the Nepalese capital as planned the next morning, and that was the last I saw of this great traveller.